I am Andrew Sheeran from Terrible Games. Um, I'm a radical board game designer, um, and all best job titles need some explanation. Um, so what I do, as was uh, just said there, thanks for the introduction, um, is I use traditional game formats, board games, card games, things like that, um, to explore political subjects, socio-political subjects. And because these are, um, involve human behaviors and motives, uh, then my game mechanics involve psychological things rather than the more mathematical and probabilistic mechanics that you tend to get in games. So in short, it's a bit more like this than this. Um, and I got here quite accidentally. Um, it all began back in 2003 on the eve of the Iraq war. Um, I was watching the news with my best friend. We were feeling a bit despondent, a bit powerless. And we were being fed this story, this rather polarizing story about good guys and bad guys. And in George Bush's own words, it was, you're either with us or against us. Um, and we thought, well, what would happen if we turn this into a game? Because it felt like a game. And what if this game was as simplistic as the narrative that we were being sold? But behind the scenes was every bit as Machiavellian, mendacious, and morally bankrupt as the war turned out to be. And so, War and Terror, the board game, was born. Although only half born, because in fact, it took the best part of about three years of testing, developing, research, to get it to the point where we were happy that the experience of playing this game was akin to the realpolitik of the wider conflict. Um, here's a shot of the board. You see the axis of evil. There's a spinner in the middle there, and, and it also comes with a balaclava with the word evil on, on the forehead. Um, the, the best way to describe War and Terror, for those of you who have never played it or seen it, is it's a bit like Risk with terrorists, oil, and secret messages. That's all you need to know. Uh, the twist in this game is that um, you are allowed to fund the very terrorism you're meant to be fighting, and players often do, even though it makes no sense whatsoever. So um, it was all going well. We had about a month to release. And then one morning, we woke up to this. Um, this is a local paper, and they dedicated no fewer than five pages to the story, um, redefining, I think, the phrase slow news day. And um, what we weren't prepared for is the level of vitriol, hatred. We were called sick. We got death threats. There were serious proposals for us to be prosecuted under new anti-terror laws. Um, because apparently we were promoting terrorism. Um, even our local MP waded in. And um, you've got to bear in mind that this is, this is about a month before release. No one interviewed in this story um, had seen the game, let alone played it. So what followed is we got put through the press ringer a bit. And in the following weeks, everyone from Forbes to Fox News, Playboy's Al Jazeera covered the story. Um, and the result of this was, was really damaging, actually. Um, although we got hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of free publicity, um, business partners backed out, shops wouldn't touch us with a barge pole, uh, we got banned from pretty much every toy and game fair in the world. Um, most, most hurtful, perhaps, the, the British Toy and Hobby Association refused our application for membership. That still burns to this day. Um, <laughs> There came a tipping point, though, and this happened kind of locally. Um, the Kent police uh, seized some games and classified them as dangerous weapon. What they'd done is they'd raided an environmental camp. In their hoard, they, they scooped up everything that uh, could be used as a weapon. And this is the official police photograph that they released to the waiting press. Um, uh, they're proudly displaying what they found, and of course, many of the journalists spotted there's a board game there. And their rationale was that um, the balaclava that comes in the box could be used to disguise your identity if you were to commit a criminal act. Um, and I just want to say, if there are any representatives of the Ken Constabulary here, a belated thank you for tripling our sales in, in this period, because <laughs> it was uh, really kind of you. Um, fortunately, people realized this was just stupid. And we started to get a bit of a bounce back, which in fact was every bit as absurd as the backlash that started everything off. So because we had no shops willing to take a gamble in this game, independent organizations stepped forward and offered an outlet. 
which meant that people like Amnesty International and the Nobel Peace Center were among our first stockists. Um, independent journalists like John Pilger spoke out in defense of the game, um, ended up in places like art galleries. This is the Berlin Kunst Academy. Um, in museums, it's in the permanent collection of the Imperial War Museum, the Bodleian Library in Oxford, just places you, you just really wouldn't expect um, a board game to crop up. And perhaps near total acceptance when Graham Linehan himself requested a game for, um, for his award-winning sitcom, The IT Crowd. So, at this point, we, we wondered what was going on, and then we received this photo. And, and this is the um, Joint Battlefield and Simulations training team of the Ministry of Defense. They are here evaluating war on terror for its usefulness in giving them the upper hand in the conflict that the board game was satirizing. Um, Incidentally, they concluded it was of no use at all, but they did say it was a bloody good game, so um, <laughs> we're happy about that. Um, so things got really meta, like the war on terror, it started appearing on the front lines of the war itself. Um, we had an army chaplain use the game to teach his soldiers about the morals and ethics of war, would you believe? And most astonishingly of all, we had a couple of soldiers, serving soldiers, write to us and say, playing your game made me think twice about what I'm doing. So just think about that for a minute. By day, these guys on the streets of Baghdad, they're fighting the war on terror. In the evening, they go back to the green zone, they play the board game version, and it's the board game version that makes them think twice about what they're doing. Um, and so it, th this is insanity. Like, this shouldn't happen. A board game shouldn't do this. How was a board game able to make people think differently about a complex issue where other media had apparently failed? Because we were in no doubt at all that if this were a, a play or a film or a book, it would be largely ignored. There's something about the nature of it being a game that allowed it to cut through. Now, the theory of play is unfortunately a whole other talk, which I could uh, go on about all day. Um, but there's an element of play theory that I just want to highlight very quickly, and that is the magic circle. And the magic circle is a term coined by a Dutch social historian called Johan Heisinger in his book Homo Ludens, and it refers to the imagined protective space that we enter into when we agree to play. And it has certain fixed properties, which were um, formalized by a guy called Roger Caillois later, a French intellectual, um, which is kind of tautology, I'm not sure there are any other types. Um, and the, the idea is that when you enter into the magic circle, you enter into it voluntarily, you all agree that the laws and rules of the real world are temporarily suspended. And then the game then acts as a kind of a sand pit in which you can explore the roles you're given safely. And most importantly, when the game is over and the magic, soul, uh, magic circle is dissolved, everything returns back to how it was. And that means you can't reasonably hold it against your best mate if she nukes you out of existence during the game. So, or you're not meant to anyway. But um, what this means in the context of war and terror is that that game was allowing people to discuss and play with a taboo subject in a safe environment temporarily, and in the process, understand a bit more about the subject and even themselves. So we thought, how, what else could we do? Uh, you know, we realized that play had, had huge powers, and we turned our attention to other subjects. We tried to tackle the failures of global capitalism, um, the dangers of religious dogma. There's the Ten Commandments. Um, but it wasn't until we started getting requests from other people um, to do games that we realized how broad this subject was. So we, we got requests to do games to be used as campaign materials, uh, to be used as training aids, uh, opening night event games, and even clinical analysis tools. And so we realized, actually, there's a lot of power to be had in changing people's perceptions about more everyday interactions. We didn't have to tackle these big subjects. So, um, this is our current project. It's a, it's a suite of games that um, are for protest situations. Um, we, we wondered if we could take something extremely stressful like police detention and turn it into something joyous instead, changing people's perceptions of what they're experiencing through play. So this is Meta Kettle. For those of you who are not familiar with the term, kettling is a 
controversial police tactic which indiscriminately rounds up uh, whole groups of people and holds them there, sometimes for upwards of, of hours, without access to basic amenities like water, medicine, shelter, things like that. If you're in a kettle, a police kettle, it's, it's incredibly intimidating. You're in a large group of people, it's diverse, families, young, old, whatever alike. So, so this is a game, it's a physical game, to be played if you're caught in a kettle until you're not kettled anymore. And the game itself involves kettling other groups of people inside the kettle. <laughs> um, and then, once it's over, the police have won. Um, so, but the important thing about this game is that you don't even have to play it for it to, in, to impart a shift of power. Because just knowing that the game Meta Kettle exists means that if you were ever in one, you can turn an involuntary detention situation, an involuntary conflict situation, into a voluntary play one. In a similar vein, this is a, a game of solitaire for people in solitary confinement, which doesn't use cards or pieces and can just be played on your fingers. Um, for political prisoners and activists like uh, the number one killer is, is stress. Um, it's, sorry, number one stress is, is boredom and the lack of focus and morale that comes with it. So this is, this is a tool that can be used to, again, shift perception. Oh, Simon and Garfunkel. I've come, I've come to talk um, to you. Okay, so enough of, enough of what I do. Um, I'm going to finish last minute. I'm going to tell you how to make your own persuasive games because it's very easy and I'm sure you can come up with many more applications than, than we have. So, first time ever, this is the Terrible Games Persuasive Toolkit. You, there are three main approaches, and they all build upon existing games. So it's really easy to do. Number one is metaphor. Lots of games have central characteristics or mechanics that lend themselves brilliantly to metaphor. All you need to do is rename the game, rename the roles to bring out that metaphor, and you radically change the game experience. So, for example, playground head injury favorite British bulldog, <laughs> rename it, give the players explicit labels, <laughs> and I, I tell you, the resulting game will be highly charged. And um, I tell you what, we could have an epic game of Brexit Bulldog at lunchtime. Uh, maybe Dominic can lead one of the teams. Um, number two, inversion. Shut up, just shut up, shut up. No, I won't. I'm going to stand between you and coffee until we're done. Um, Inversion. If you take the, uh, the main narrative of a game and you subvert or invert it, then reimagine what the game would follow. So, for example, Pokemon. What if it wasn't about hoarding and enslavery, but more about distribution and sharing? Then you might have something like this. Um, <laughs> thirdly, um, sometimes you don't have to do anything. Sometimes all you need to do is highlight an accepted behavior that is so normal people haven't uh, questioned it. This works particularly well for a lot of games because they come from the status quo and they normalize things like uh, conflict being for the strong and money being the absolute measure of success. Or in the case of Settlers, which is one of the best-selling modern board games of its time, um, imperialism. And so you imagine if you ask players to colonize the West Bank, it would be significantly more uncomfortable than colonizing a distant fantasy island. So um, that's it. Now you know how to do it. You can go change the world. Um, all you need to do is remember is that um, playing games have got the power to change perception um, by allowing players not just to see the world differently, but to live it differently too. Okay, thank you very much. Tragically, we don't have enough time for any questions. There's just, one, just, one, just one caveat. So Rory has just no, one. Just, you can, you can, they can backfire. Monopoly was originally created as yes. an anti-capitalist board yeah, game by Georgists who wanted a land value tax. I, I had ten slides on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, 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 I know. <laughs> but sometimes these marketing ideas backfire. The Wild Rover was composed as a temperance song, interestingly. Um, so no time for questions, but you can kettle Andrew right now over coffee because uh, he's going to yes. be there. So do quiz away. I think it's a fantastic idea.